Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our series of podcasts that we call Menninger Mindscape. I'm Dr. John Oldham, professor of psychiatry at Baylor College of Medicine. It's been my privilege to host and chair these series uh, of podcasts where we've had some really wonderful guests, as we have today. So today we're delighted to be joined by Dr. John Carr Zubieta. John Carr, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. Dr. Zubieta is going to be one of our speakers at our symposium tomorrow, which is our third annual national symposium that Menninger sponsors here in Houston. And this theme this year is called Emotion Regulation and Dysregulation. And Dr. Zubieta is right on target because he's a neuroscientist who's studying the neurobiology of many, many aspects of emotion regulation and dysregulation in conditions like mood disorders, uh, even things like chronic pain and other things where there's a wide variation of management, I guess is a way to say it, of one's reactions to stress. And stress can have a huge impact leading to very strong emotional reactions, but isn't there a wide range of how people deal with stress? Some people go to pieces, some people just handle it. Talk to us about that. Yes. Well, it's all about neurobiology, right? So you basically have uh, systems in the brain that are involved in representing, modulating, um, stress responses which include emotional reactions. Emotional reactions are critical for the organism response to environmental change. So, and we need emotions to be able to identify things that are negative, that are positive and drive our behavior. So in that sense we've looked at these processes using uh, imaging technologies, primarily functional magnetic resonance imaging, also positive emission tomography to look at molecular targets. And from the point of view of function, we know that there are a number of different areas of the brain that are involved in uh, receiving this information uh, regarding the emotional content of our environment, um, such as the insular cortex, the amygdala, the subgenual anterior cingulate. And then that those emotions are actually processed there. They are also regulated by prefrontal cortical regions, areas that form part of the so-called executive. So, okay, so, so I'm interrupting because it's kind mm -hmm. of a top-down mm -hmm. process in the brain so yes. that the deeper structures uh, where the emotions kind of are generated or managed um, are then sometimes regulated, sometimes better, sometimes not so well, by the cortex, um, which is kind of the, the brakes of the system in a way. Yes, in many ways that is the okay. case. Okay. Exactly. And then you have chemical systems that are very much involved in these processes. So for example, dopamine, which is important for things like um, a reward and also responding to salient stimuli, um, are also regulated through these prefrontal mechanisms and are very much involved in our, in our uh, in driving our behavior um, towards reward or against, you know, potential danger. Uh, we've also studied uh, mechanisms such as the endogenous opioid, which is one of the principal uh, mechanisms involved in uh, stress regulation and emotion regulation. Mm -hmm. It's a very primitive system. So that's been interesting because it's taught as much about inter-individual variation in these processes and how they um, are related to pathologies such as major depression, for example, uh, even personality disorders mm -hmm. such as borderline personality right, disorder. Right. And uh, interestingly enough, it's also allowed us to um, think about um, emotion regulation not just in the context of you know, the classic you know, depression or anxiety disorders, but also in the context of comorbid conditions such as chronic pain. Mm -hmm. So chronic pain is a stressor, it's a medical illness or it's a medical condition that um, is a chronic stressor and it dysregulates many of these mechanisms. And in fact, uh, for uh, patients diagnosed with, say, fibromyalgia or chronic low back pain or other painful conditions, um, the comorbidity, the occurrence with uh, depression is enormous, it's about 60%. Is it 60%? That's mm. interesting. It's quite large, yeah. Because yeah. mm. we have here um, a, an inpatient part of the Menninger Clinic, which is called the Comprehensive Psychiatric Assessment Service. Mm. And on that service, we have a special track for patients with chronic pain. Yes. But almost all of them are here because they not only have chronic pain, 
but they also have often major depression, mm -hmm. often also a severe personality disorder, mm -hmm. and almost always some kind of substance use problem that's in the mix as well. It's hard to disentangle all of that and Very then figure so. out how to help. In particular in chronic pain, because you are using medications that have potential for uh, addiction and tolerance, such as the opioids, in a therapeutic fashion. So for a particular individual that may be more predisposed, you know, that may induce taking too much medication, misuse, and dependence on them uh, over time. And to disentangle all these factors is quite complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, if you're boiling down what you know so far, um, what would your headlines be in terms of what you're learning? Or is there a generalizable kind of um, conclusion that you can suggest at this point in terms of emotion regulation? One thing you said is that it's, it, it's um, kind of managed, that's the word I used before, in the amygdala, and that's where I just call it the engine or the motor uh, where the emotions come from. But is there a pathway that you're most interested in that may have the biggest bang for the buck um, in terms of what we can do to help people who have this emotion dysregulation, even though it's not one thing, it's a lot of things? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the main issue to realize is that there is tremendous inter-individual variation in the function of these mechanisms. And the idea behind using these imaging technologies to study that inter-individual variation is that then it gives us cues as to um, why some individuals may be more resilient and others may be more vulnerable. In that sense, we actually have a pretty good idea of the areas that are actually involved. So, for example, connections between the amygdala and the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex appear critical for that interface between the individual, say, genetic vulnerability and environmental factors. So childhood um, maltreatment, in fact, uh, uh, impacts on that particular pathway to induce uh, worse emotion regulation and, um, and typically poorer outcomes or a much higher likelihood of developing depression. But that is also in the context of a genetic background. Mm -hmm. If you think about, say, bipolar disorder, for example, a classic mood disorder, the contribution or the, gene the genetic contribution to the illness is about 70 percent, but or 80 percent, between 70 and 80 percent. But the difficulty is that for a given family cohort, um, that may be generated by a particular genetic variation, while others may be another genetic variation. So I think understanding that genetic variation, number one, two, how is being impacted by environmental factors, meaning epigenetic modulation, and then how that impacts brain function, mm -hmm. that is how we are able to learn, you know, what, uh, where is that variation coming from and how is it translated mm -hmm. into vulnerability in a particular human. There is still much work to be done there. But it's getting there. Yeah. So, I mean, we talk about suicide as another outcome mm -hmm. of sort of mood, uh, enormously powerful emotions. And we know a lot of risk factors mm -hmm. that we can list in terms of suicide risk. But the ability to predict which individual specifically is more likely to actually suicide versus another with similar risk factors who won't is very, very difficult. So here's my question. Mm -hmm. How far away are we? or how close are we to being able with an imaging or a set of imaging procedures see patterns of the brain that help us predict which patient is going to be at higher risk and which will be sturdier and less likely to be at high risk. There is already some information about that. I mean, I think the challenge is that when you look at imaging data, um, there is some sense already that particular patterns related to activity in areas such as the cingulate region, subgenual cingulate, for example, as well as the insular cortex and the amygdala, are uh, predictive of uh, worse outcomes or better outcomes mm -hmm. with treatment. The problem is to do that at the individual level. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, it's relatively easy to take a number of patients diagnosed with a particular illness or a particular characteristic and then saying, well, you know, this brain region is dysregulated and that dysregulation, you know, leads to a poorer outcome for a given treatment. That people are already working on that and there are some decent uh, and reasonable 
uh, results uh, related to it. The problem is to do it individually. Mm -hmm. So that's where the challenge uh, lies right now. You know, what for a particular individual, are there particular characteristics that we can, because of a dysregulation in a particular area or, or, or series of regions, would be predictive? And I think that is one thing that we are not quite there yet. Okay, but mm -hmm. is it likely that as we study that and work toward that goal, that you combine that with genetic data mm -hmm. and other kinds of data in terms of family patterns that will enhance the predictive power? Yes, that is the hope. Mm -hmm. That is the hope. I mean, for at this point in time, for a given genetic variant associated with any of these illnesses, that, is, uh, that particular genetic variant explains relatively a small amount of variance mm -hmm. in a particular behavior, if you want, or say trade anxiety or you know emotion dysregulation traits. Um, <clears throat> But by studying those variants, we at least get to learn what are the pathways by which these, these regulations actually take place and then try to generalize that information. So I think slowly over time, we are getting to a point where eventually we will have a capacity to at least develop um, a, a, a set of high level risk factors mm -hmm. that then can help us with treatment decisions later on. The other part of studying these mechanisms, too, is that they also give us targets for treatment. Because mm -hmm. if you know that, say, there is a abnormality in a particular calcium channel or a particular inflammatory mechanism that leads to a disease or a type of disease or a subtype of disease or a particular outcome, um, you can actually target that because you know what that abnormality is. So there is actually much hope uh, in the combination of these uh, tools genetic, epigenetic, and imaging to actually learn much from and, and then lead to new treatments. Yeah. So. Well, actually, we never have enough time and we're looking forward to hearing more about this tomorrow. One last point I would make is that your work uh, will be very informative and interesting to our researchers here at Menninger because we have a system-wide protocol where we have standardized interviews clinically but also outcomes data and we're doing brain imaging and genetic uh, sampling of all of our patients. And we're particularly looking at areas that we've so far found interesting, which were around connectivity around the habenula. Sure. But yeah. there are other areas, of course, waiting to be looked at. Uh, yeah. And your work will be very helpful as we try to understand that and move forward. So thank you for joining us today. It's a little preview of coming attractions, which is tomorrow, but we'll also have many ways to learn about your work. So appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for joining us again, and we'll see you next time.